planet's puppet masters almost surely have a plan There's clearly maybe something there beyond the realm of man And until you thoroughly tested every last close just True, Dr. Sayers. Very well. Where would we be without THC? Cause we know they're lying to us, just don't know to what degree. Yeah, where would we be without THC? The highest side chat show. Greg Carwood and Company. How's it going, people? Smoking a little smoke, drinking a little drink, and trying to get mentally prepared to dive right into the deep end of the pool. From sunny San Diego, I'm Greg Carlwood. And we know the deceptions of the shadowy elite run deep, and our understanding of humanity's past clearly manipulated by establishment-sponsored academics who constantly reinforce a pre-approved paradigm and treat any new discoveries with a firm, nothing to see here. Well, I think we all disagree, and dissecting the ancient past, looking for a more accurate and complete picture of the human story, that's got to be one of the most important things we can do. Of course, many alternative researchers have been examining ancient texts, ancient megalithic structures, ancient man-made underground tunnel systems, and more in the quest for reconstruction, and it seems increasingly likely that the story of our past is a lot weirder than we've been led to believe. From ideas that humanity was genetically engineered by an ancient alien race, and more literal interpretations of the cosmic war described in the Vedic texts, to the understanding that man was at the very least more in tuned and conscious of other forms of non-human intelligence, it's a glaring juxtaposition to the mundane 9-to-5 Rockefeller-Rothschild reality of today, and I'm always eager to hear new information and ideas about the ancient past, so today is quite a treat. This is going to be a very unique show, and several people have worked really hard to make it happen. Listeners might remember previous guest Sylvier Ivanoa, who joined me to talk about the new chronology movement, this idea that history has radically been altered during the Reformation period, and much of what we think came before the 1500s has been made up, slanted, and recreated to a staggering degree. We talked about a lot of modern discoveries that contradict the official story of history, and a lot more in that episode. Of course, she detailed a lot of this in her series, When the Survivors of Atlantis and Hyperborea Wake Up, which can be found on her YouTube channel, New Earth. I really loved that show because the new chronology movement seems to be popular, or at least on the radar in alternative circles in non-English speaking countries, Russian in particular, but it hadn't really made it to an English speaking audience very often at all. And I was very proud to take part in that. And you might remember a discussion about going deeper into what non-English speaking researchers are coming out with. Well, I've asked Sylvie if she would be willing to translate an interview between me and one of her personal favorite Russian researchers of ancient antiquity, Alexander Koltipin. Now, a lot of Alexander's work can be found on his website, earthbeforeflood.com, and it took a lot of work dealing with Google's shaky translation, but I learned a lot of interesting stuff from him, lots of which was totally new to me. Of course, that is kind of the goal in crossing the language barrier. So I typed out all my questions, gave them to Sylvier, who translated the whole five or six pages into Russian. We all got on Skype together. I recorded over two hours of Sylvier reading my questions in Russian and Alexander responding. Then she took the recording and translated his responses, and then she sent me a recording of her reading his responses in English. She did quite a lot, and I owe her big thanks. I tried to make this sound as natural as I could, but it does get a little clunky at parts, but I think it's well worth it, and big thanks to her for the hours and hours of her time again to help make it happen. Do check out her New Earth channel or the amazing redesign she's done on her website, megaliths.org. So, so many sites around the globe mapped out and expanded. It is really great. But big thanks to both of them. I just wanted to explain to you guys what was going on. It is a unique show for sure. So I hope you appreciate what comes out of it. Now, one last thing before I introduce the guest and get this party started. We did get a new song made for the show. It is a bit of a personal milestone for me because about 10 years ago, I went to see one of my favorite artists. They might be Giants in St. Louis. And they had a quirky opening act that was a long-haired, white-suited guy with an accordion named Cornmo. And this is the kind of uniqueness that I'm already going to be on board with out of the gate. But not only did I really like his style and his music, he did a cover of Queen's We Are the Champions, where in the middle, he broke down his personal story of working in a shitty warehouse to get by 
knowing that he wanted a greater life, so he practiced the accordion as much as he could. He let the hate for that bullshit job fuel his playing more and more until he got good enough that he got invited to tour and play in the circus. So he grew a pair and he took the risk and now he's out there living the dream and we are the champions, my friends. You know, it was great. It really was. Well, that resonated with me so much. It stuck with me all this time. I was always worried about having the same type of struggle. And now that we're doing well, I contacted Corn Mo, who's still out there making music. And I told him how inspiring he had been and how thankful I am to be living my dream instead of a passionless nine to five. And he wrote a new song for the show to add to our list of rotating tracks. I personally love it. It's just the kind of thing I'd expect from the guy. And I wanted to give you listeners a little context for why you're hearing it and why I think it's so great. So I'm going to debut this Cornmo masterpiece for you. And then I'll be introducing Alexander and getting the ball rolling with Sylvia Ivanoa. So park your ass and pack your glass. And I'll see you on the other side. Lucid dreams are so vivid Cause you go to bed at seven And your brain comes alive Cause you hate your nine to five You wake up with a dread And make sure your cats are fed Did your brain talk to a ghost Who moved your coffee and your toast As you listen to the higher side chats You get to your desk And your boss says it's a mess And your soul slowly grows To a place where nothing grows When you think he's not around You insert a set of sound The OM says turn it down And you say it's just the higher side chats Oh, do you think you'd be invited To Bohemia Grove To a Bilderberg Club Oh, do you think you'd be invited by a Rothschild to a party on a submarine Diving down to the center of the earth Through the Marianas Trench Your teeth begin to clench from the sulfurous stench The mask you're given doesn't fit Cause you're not one of them Starting today, you'll make plans to get away There's no one to hold you down And the what-ifs start to drown Then you wake to the glare of a cold fluorescent stare And the light winks at you Cause its life is almost through But it's holding on to quit time just like you It's time for the high side chats That's what I'm talking about. The magic of Cornmo. All right, people. I am happy to be playing my part in bringing Alexander Coltyman's work to an English-speaking audience, I think for the first time, at least probably being the only two-hour English-speaking interview with him. Major credit to Sylvie, of course, who not only put in twice as many hours as me to make it happen, but she also introduced me to Alexander's work and his perspective that civilized man goes back millions of years, and our history most likely involves many beings that have been regulated to myths and lore in recent years. And for those unfamiliar, Alexander has quite the resume. He graduated with honors from the Moscow Geological Prospecting Institute and took postgraduate courses at the Institute of Oceanology at the Russian Academy of Sciences. For 15 years, he took part in geological expeditions across the planet and together with like-minded researchers and scientists created the Society for Learning About Earth's Mysteries and Enigmas. Since 2003, he's been the editor-in-chief of several scientific magazines. He's also written several books on his own. And for over two decades, he's been collecting and analyzing scientific data on several different aspects of the unknown, combing through archaeological discoveries, examining the megalithic structures and underground ruins of the world, and cross-referencing the hard evidence with mythology and legends to get a clearer picture of the past. You can find much of his work at his fascinating website, earthbeforeflood.com. I'm very lucky to be speaking with him through Sylvie today. Alexander, welcome to the show. Hello, everybody, and thank you for the opportunity. Oh, for sure, man. It really is an honor and a pleasure to do this. And I think there are great researchers all over the globe. And when we can get past the language barrier, we can learn about ideas and perspectives that might not be on the radar of as many English-speaking guests that I could have. 
and I've really loved what I've been reading on your website since Sylvia recommended it. You deal with a lot of underground complexes and the potential of beings down below, which are topics always near and dear to my heart. And you deal with time periods that are really hard to fathom, tens of millions of years in many cases. But how would you introduce the totality of your research to a group who might not be familiar with your work? I'm trying to find out the actual and real history of the human civilization instead of simply repeating what I have been told in the school and in the university. Fair enough. Definitely a mission that many of us here will respect and appreciate. And to start at the beginning, you write about a hierarchy of generations of gods and creators in the ancient past on your site. And I like how you describe it. You say, In the mythology of the majority of people living on the earth, lots of evidence accumulated that being similar and not similar to the modern people had lived on earth until at least 66 million years ago, and that they had much more knowledge of the world than we, had flight vehicles and space stations, traveled to other planets and other galaxies, and possessed technologies and weapons we'd consider magic today. These beings, which legends name gods and demons, have rendered the most direct influence on all of the history of our planet during this Cenozoic period, and not to recognize or hide this fact is inhumanly. I like that. Can you elaborate on the Cenozoic period and what that epoch looks like to you? My geological studies, by chance, so to say, developed in such a way that the Cenozoic period geological sites are the ones I mostly focused on. This uh, happened to be so since the early years when I was studying in the university and later on when I started my academic career in the University of uh, Moscow and other institutions. It always happened so that I explored sites of the Cenozoic period, primarily ones of the later Cenozoic. For some 20 years, I did most of my work at this type of sites all over Kamchatka, Chukotka, Asia Minor, and various other regions. So after spending some 20 years on various expeditions at the primarily Cenozoic sites, I think I can say that I'm well familiar with the aging patterns of these types of rocks. Now, how did I come to the conclusion that uh, during the Cenozoic period there were human or other intelligent uh, societies flourishing on our planet? They were advanced, they had their flying vehicles, they were also driving cars and so on. I believe that they had the big cities very much like us. For example, in his work entitled Lemuria, the famous Rerich describes the end of the Mesozoic period when the earth was still inhabited by dinosaurs as the time when the race of the so-called sons of the wisdom landed on our planet. More or less the same time frame is mentioned in the myths of other cultures, for example in the Slavic context, that is Chernobog, and in the Vedic context, Rig Veda, Mahabharata, and so on, that's Vritra. And all of them landed on Earth when big reptilians were still walking the land. After landing on Earth, we hear from the Vedic literature that the Adityas, those who landed, that's how they are called in the Vedas, they entered a fierce battle with the local reptilian residents and the absolutely same story we hear from the Slavic sources. Over there, the party of Svarog fights the reptilians. The battle took place in the skies, in the air, but it resulted in a disaster for the full planet, a naturally brought cataclysm, the only escape from which would be underground. Very similar scenarios we find in the traditional myths of Scandinavia, Sumeria and Iran. And in all of them always this element is present that the first settlers on earth came from outer space exactly at the time when big reptilians were walking the earth. And uh, this is uh, the best way to 
approximately date this first arrival. So it seems the first human-like settlers landed somewhere in deep antiquity towards the end of Cretaceous period, maybe some uh, 70, 75 or even uh, 65 millions of years ago. But they were not the only wave of settlers that came to our planet. Uh, for example, in a number of um, old myths, we hear about another wave of uh, reptilian-like um, newcomers who lived uh, partially on land and partially in the water. Some out of the numerous examples in this group would be the Sumerian god Enki and the Native American goddess of Chalchutlikue. Then yet another group called Daitias arrived. They were human-like in terms of uh, looks, but they were demoniac in nature. According to the myths, all kinds of interesting creatures were also on Earth at that time. Some of them had many hands, so there were enormous flying snakes, giants, chimeras, and many others. Now, from the point of view of a geologist, I wanted to make some sort of a parallel between the timings of uh, these uh, waves of uh, settlers from space that were coming to Earth and uh, somehow tie them up to the known geological periods and the catastrophes that occurred. And I immediately noticed that um, the number of uh, these conflict-caused cataclysms is same as the number of great cataclysmic periods known to us. So after attaching the historical data of the myths to the geological timeline of Earth, I found out that uh, actually the Neogen period was uh, particularly rich in uh, intelligent activity on Earth. Part of the Neogen period and in a particular, the middle and the end of the Miocene period, namely some 15 to 5 million years ago, was a time particularly rich in uh, culture and uh, human activity. And it seems that uh, most of uh, what we call fairy tales and uh, myths actually reflect events that took place at that time. It uh, was a time when elves and gnomes and all kinds of uh, exotic serpents lived around. And indeed, um, in the layers, geological layers to that time, we find uh, really lots of uh, ruins of uh, buildings. And not only buildings, the layers, the geological layers belonging to that period are extremely rich in uh, vehicle tracks and uh, such tracks can be found uh, on almost all continents. Yes, the tracks are very interesting. I've seen them on your website. Definitely something you are known for analyzing. And I do like that you write about werewolves, fairies, demons, lizard people, serpent beings, and a lot of other creatures, usually thought to be fantasy or mythology. But you're not shy when it comes to writing about these beings as if they were real. That's interesting to me. What do you think are the best arguments or the best evidence that these were real beings on the earth and not just fantasy like academic authorities tell us? There was that old movie about the unicorn, and the slogan of the movie was, whatever you believe in, that's the reality. But this is more of a poetic answer, I know. Well, in the case of the large reptilian inhabitants of uh, former Earth, we have an abundance of archaeological findings, and those are the skeletons of various what we call dinosaurs. Moreover, we have all kinds of uh, varieties of dinosaurs. Some of them live on land, others uh, swim in the seas, and yet others fly in the skies. And the same are the descriptions of the reptilian dragons. That's how they are called in the context of uh, what usually people call myths. 
These are simply different words for the very same thing. And uh, by the way, the most uh, recent uh, related dinosaurs discoveries point towards the fact that uh, dinosaurs also survived the great uh, catastrophe, at least to some extent, and some remains were dated to 55 million years ago. And a very interesting uh, dinosaur-related case was reported for me by a business owner from Laos. So what happened over there was uh, actually that a Japanese team of uh, scientists performed uh, dating on dinosaur remains and um, those showed results of uh, only 17 million years of age. When uh, the news came out in the scientific uh, community, another American team arrived on the spot and put a ban on the information so that people don't get confused, you know. But I personally had my friends, the business owners, visit uh, the local museum and uh, inquire about everything in detail, and that is the source of uh, my information. In terms of beings with uh, many hands, no, we don't have any confirmed uh, findings in terms of uh, bones, for example, but the parallels in the myths of uh, variously supposedly unrelated uh, cultures are too many to be just a pure coincidence. For example, we hear about the ancient Chinese giant Chi Yu. He was uh, flying, he had also many hands, and he was uh, flying on a chariot in the skies, very much like uh, the Indian demon Ravana. And in China, he is straightforwardly considered as somebody who landed from space. Also, the myths of the Sumerians, the Greeks, and even the Native Americans are abundant with this type of creatures. For example, the Hopi Indians, without any doubt, consider themselves descendants of a space traveler, something like a spider woman. She also had many hands. And in terms of uh, chimeras, it seems that they lived even in the not-so-far-away past. For example, Saint uh, Bartolomeo was a contemporary of Christ, and he himself had uh, the head of a dog. Bartolomeo, the apostle, was uh, highly respected by Christ himself. He was a preacher of the true faith, and even up to the 15th century, he was uh, depicted on uh, the church frescoes the way he really looked like. And only after that point, this started to be considered inappropriate, and uh, subsequently he was depicted with human head. In uh, terms of uh, tribes consisting of uh, people with dog heads, we also see such uh, historic records in the travels of the Alexander the Great, his conquests. They were particularly mentioned as uh, fierce warriors that are very difficult to defeat. Also, there is abundance of accounts of kind of uh, human-like but amphibian creatures. It seems they were uh, very common and they were as often mentioned as those um, so-called white gods. They are literally everywhere in uh, China, in Japan, even the brother of the sun goddess Amaterasu was uh, one of them. The legend of the Mayan tribes are also full of such type of accounts of amphibian creatures. Amongst them would be the Fomorians of Ireland, of course. And in Egypt, it's interesting that uh, amphibian creatures were uh, ruling lower Egypt parallel at the time when um, the race of the white gods was uh, ruling Upper Egypt. And as if by some rules, 
always uh, some sort of an amphibian creature would uh, intermarry somebody from uh, the white gods and the offspring. The result of such an union would become a ruler of uh, the Mayas, the Sumerians, the Chinese, the Japanese, always the same story. So the myths of uh, nations divided by oceans tell the same story, even in minor details, and um, this cannot be the result of a pure coincidence. Mm, we well, are right. The similarities in stories are hard to ignore, but I wonder if there might not be another explanation for how such ideas could cross the ocean, because we know that entheogens and psychedelics were much more common in cultures of the past. What's described on DMT trips today are also very similar types of hybrid beings to what was described then. And maybe in the past, our connection was so much stronger to them that it was more of a physical thing. But is it possible that these monsters and chimeras and creatures that people were seeing and describing and writing about weren't literally on the earth, but were more shamanic in nature? I think they had uh, very real forms and bodies like ourselves because the depictions of them uh, mixing amongst the historic uh, figures are abundant in um, Laos, in India, in all this South Asia. In the Buddhist temple, they are accepted as uh, absolutely real saints. Their statues are found and worshipped along with the statues of Buddha himself. In Laos, in Cambodia, people worship them so wholeheartedly. They bow before them, uh, hug them, pray to them as much as they do to Buddha. At a certain location in uh, Mekong, once per year, on a certain day of the lunar calendar, the Nagas, the serpentine creatures, that's how they call them, they still live under earth. So on this particular day, they um, sent to the surface balls of fire. And this is an event of the magnitude of the miracle of the holy fire in Orthodox Christianity. Good points. It's compelling. But I think there is a way for these entities to be well-defined and widely depicted and heavily worshipped and have them still be shamanic in nature or something like Crowley's Lam. But to talk more about the Earth in the ancient past, within the Cenozoic period, it seems like we have smaller chapters that we can examine. Can you talk to us about the Paleocene and Paleogene periods from 65 to 34 million years ago? What was the world like then? Was this the Golden Age people refer to? I know you mentioned a water vapor envelope that covered the globe, which sounds a lot like the plasma envelope talked about in the Electric Universe model. But what can you tell us about how the Earth was different back then? When we speak about the Paleogene and the Paleocene, first of all, they are considered to be relatively well studied due to the extensive uh, drilling related with the oil industry, drilling in the Arctic and Antarctic regions. So what is extremely interesting is that the climate was the same all over the planet. We didn't get at that time those uh, climate zones like now, equatorial, subequatorial, tropical, subtropical, and so on. That did not exist. The temperature was pretty much stable, between 25 and 30 degrees Celsius on what we now call Arctic. Magnolias were flowering, palms were growing, tortoises and crocodiles were roaming around. This is not some sort of a hypothesis, it is pretty much a proven fact because we are drilling so much all over the place and the remains of such uh, plants and animals are coming up in great abundance. And I personally don't find any other reasonable explanation besides the one that the full earth was uh, covered by a 
vapor envelope, so to say. Some American researchers even uh, go further exploring this uh, hypothesis. They not only talk about this uh, vapor envelope, but also uh, they suggest that there were rings around the Earth as well. So native people from all around the world talk about a bygone golden age when the climate on the full planet was uh, very mild and pleasant. All the food was uh, growing by itself just because nature was so rich and abundant. So such descriptions very correctly depict the time when the earth possibly had this uh, vapor envelope around, which was creating such uh, favorable conditions. And this is the only known period in the history of the world where such a golden age could have existed on a global scale. Because according to the myths, this was a worldwide golden age. And if there were some other minor golden ages, they would have been... Uh, more of a local periods and not on a global scale. And uh, since the sons of wisdom, as Rorich called them, or the Adityas according to Mahabharat, landed on Earth during the Mesozoic period, it uh, fits this uh, picture very well. Yes, then they could have uh, lived in this uh, world of uh, natural abundance and uh, pleasant global climate. And the situation with the continents is quite interesting at that time. There was no Arctic uh, seas at that time. It was all one continent, stretching all the way from current America to nowadays uh, Gobi and Tibet. There wasn't even Tibet at that time. It was all submerged. Actually, various seas started forming in the Arctic region only 55 million years ago. Uh, it happened uh, gradually, and uh, only then this uh, continent that was known as Lavrasia before that uh, started uh, cracking, the seas started appearing, and uh, gradually it started all looking what we see on the famous uh, map of Mercator. And this is the exact same story that uh, we hear from uh, Mahabharata, from the Sumerian own history, from uh, the myths of Iran. There were these uh, white gods and they lived in the north. They say explicitly it was in the north. The nature was giving everything in abundance. The life was like, uh, for our standards, something like an eternal holiday. They lived in uh, peace and harmony and uh, coexisted with uh, various huge reptilians slash uh, dragons or dinosaurs. It was uh, very interesting because when I saw one's um, artistic depiction, the idea of an artist, how the earth would have looked like at the time that it had this um, shield or envelope of uh, vapor, it strongly reminded me of the depictions that we have of the planet Uranus. Then I started um, researching about the Uranus. Moreover, it's got those uh, rings and uh, the Earth might have had such as well, according to the hypothesis I mentioned earlier. It turned out that uh, Uranus has got a hard core, as uh, hard as our Earth, and then on the outside it's got this uh, envelope. So all we know about uh, Uranus is uh, not direct, of course, these are still uh, models of uh, what we think it is, but they say inside it is pretty small and um, it uh, rotates independently of this uh, outer covering. We don't really know what is this uh, covering made of, but it is entirely possible that it is uh, made of air and it uh, does create this uh, greenhouse effect 
the envelopes have on the planet below. According to results delivered by American space expeditions, they report that on the edge of this shield around Uranus, temperature of some 20 degrees Celsius supposedly were reported. So it is entirely possible that although the planet is relatively far from the sun, the conditions below this shield are very pleasant actually to live even according to our standards. Also, there is a good number of myths suggesting that at the time when the Earth was embraced by this vapor shield, it was also located somewhat further from the sun than it is currently. Interesting. So I'm trying to go about this fairly chronologically. And this brings us up to the Neogen period, which is considered to be 23 million years ago down to 2.5 million, which is apparently 10 million years after the Golden Age period. I mean, so much can happen in these kind of time spans, but... This Neogene period is the place where you date a lot of the underground tunnels and complexes to, and I think they are amazing. But what happened leading up to this period that caused all this underground construction we see? Well, I must say that the beginning of the Neogene period definitely stands out as very interesting. That would be some 23 to 17 millions of years ago. So, for some reason, the surface of our planet at that time became as hot as Venus. Even the gods could not live on it. And... um, Some of them returned even to heaven. And then as we try to recreate the situation from various myths from all around the world, we have the earth with um, dark and light half. It's really not clear. Did it stop rotating or somehow the axis was horizontal? How could such effect be achieved? It's uh, not really clear. In other words... Half of the planet was uh, permanently in light and half of it permanently dark. But uh, the most drastic uh, changes in history start afterwards, when um, this uh, vapor disappears and uh, then people can see a blue sky, they can see the sun, they can see the moon and the stars, but also the full rays seems to be somewhat downgraded. They start, or let's say we start living much shorter, and for example, we start delivering our babies um, in uh, usually horrible pain, while before that it was... um, quite easy. In other words, the bodies of the humans before that were nearly immortal that long they lived. But after these drastic changes, we become the mere mortals we are nowadays. And then, judging from again a lot of myths all around the world, somehow the full saga started developing much faster and people started organizing wars, fighting each other. And all these wars are um, quite well described in the myths. And I must say that I do see some geological confirmation for them. Because um, in the layers, geological layers, when they must have occurred, we always see some sort of cataclysms. That's how they look from a geological perspective. Right. So we're dealing with such ancient time periods, it's hard to get into details, but it seems like we weren't alone. We had this period of a golden age with a protective and accommodating atmosphere, and then something radical happened to completely change the environment, but intelligent beings and humanoids and humans, I guess, still survived. And because of the harsh new conditions... They built these vast systems underground, and I'm just fascinated with these underground structures and the idea of pathways to hidden lands inside the Earth. Do you think any of these tunnel systems and underground complexes you've studied lead to these places they call Shangri-La or Agartha? Yes. In the midst of uh, 
Nations on all continents we hear about wars so terrific that uh, after that people had to hide underground to remain alive. And indeed, we see a massive amount of uh, entire network of underground cities stretching on almost all continents in um, the region of uh, South Europe, just a few of them. And then going all across Asia, China, Japan, everywhere. Uh, recently, I saw also an, an amazing footage. So they are in uh, South America as well. In uh, Turkey, they are found in uh, great abundance and uh, they are better known. Those sections of them here in Russia, we have them in Crimea. Usually they have uh, many floors and uh, almost none of them are well studied. Uh, we never reach the bottom. We never dig so far. For example, in uh, South America, they stretch all the way from uh, Colombia to Chile and uh, sometimes they are isolated attempts to dig a little bit, uh, but nobody has uh, reached any bottom so far. For example, in uh, Nevada de Cachi in uh, Argentina, people constantly hear the noise of some sort of uh, motor or machine coming from the depth of uh, one kilometer. And the very same uh, thing is reported, or, or at least a very similar thing is uh, reported below the Eskikerman underground uh, city here in Russia. At places it reaches some uh, half kilometer depth, and over there in the deep, people can constantly hear the noise of uh, as if trains are passing by. I have also read reports from uh, Czech Republic and Poland, also very strange, some uh, sort of mysterious underground tunnels uh, going unknowing. Nobody knows where they go and uh, some sort of vehicles come in and out of them. What are these tunnels? Nobody knows. So are they stretching as far as uh, going even below on oceans and uh, connecting continents that uh, I have no way to find out? Or do they even connect to a possible hollow earth inside? I don't know. Usually it is considered that the classical geology cannot go along with the idea of hollow earth, but... Um, in recent times, there are geologists who are trying to prove that uh, both ideas can coexist. Hmm. Also, I know there are several stories of underground cities found in North America where strange artifacts have been found, and they say the bones of giants, too. Have you looked closer at any of these stories? Well, actually, you, Greg, you must know better about that because you're in the area. All I can point out as a source of information was that, uh, was it an Iranian official who reported that there has been, let's say, official information, if I can uh, put it in such words, about some tunnels where beings of a Nordic looks regularly come out in the open. According to that Iranian uh, report, they were in touch uh, with uh, our earthly governments and indeed were uh, governing those uh, governments. But uh, how reliable is that information? I myself don't know. And interestingly enough, Admiral Richard uh, Byrd, during his uh, famous expedition to Antarctica, might have met that very same Nordic-looking race of uh, beings. And um, basically, they are one-to-one -one with the description of the race of the white gods, which is also which race uh, we mentioned uh, many times already. 
And according to the myths, it is exactly this race of the white gods that was uh, forced to hide in underground uh, cities after a terrific um, catastrophe that, according to my dating, occurred some 34 million years ago. Huh. Wow, that is interesting. And one amazing example of these tunnel systems that you write about is in Tibet, where you say... Amazing underground structures and caves created by nature and man-made tunnels and cavities apparently are located under the palace, the residence of the Dalai Lama, in Potala, located in the Tibetan capital. I mean, this is super intriguing. Is there anything else you can tell us about this particular pathway? Actually, the entry to Agartha is supposedly somewhat uh, south of Potala, somewhere in Mongolia, as described by Osendovsky. When the Hyperboreans left their land, supposedly they separated into two groups, the Omland Kingdom of Shambhala and the Underground Kingdom of Agartha. It is hard to say at this point, is that true or not. I myself use as a source the work of uh, Sergei Volk. He is uh, going on expeditions in those regions. According to the locals in that area, the king of Agartha sometimes comes out on the surface and moves openly amongst people. This has happened five times until now. He rides on a white elephant. And by the way, this is um, a well-known attribute of Lord Indra. And Indra happens to be the king, the supreme ruler of the Adityas. In the Hindu context, Adityas are the good gods. So, Possibly they are still ruling us, they are looking after us in one way or another. Maybe we indeed do live amongst gods still. It is entirely possible that this um, underworld of Agartha is uh, much better than our world here on the top. Maybe, yeah, I do like entertaining those possibilities. And Tibet seems to have a reputation for mystical and superhuman abilities, magic in a sense, you could say. I know you've written about this, but what are your thoughts on Tibetan magic? And does it have anything to do with the connection to beings underground, perhaps? Might they still have some type of link or contact? Yes, as I wrote in one of my articles, too much evidence is... uh piling up from various sources, pointing towards a civilization that practically coexists with us currently here. And they seem to have settled uh, under the earth, also under the oceans, and on the moon. A few times I was in touch with uh, people who seemed to know more about it and promised to tell me, but each and every time something happened and they couldn't. Possibly it is uh, forbidden currently to spread such information. Yes, it definitely seems frowned upon, but I still love it. Another underground country, Agartha, you say is probably under the Gobi Desert in Mongolia and China, possibly Tibet and the Himalayas also. What more can you say about Agartha or maybe any information you might have that relates to underground worlds? This is one of my favorite subjects and what we hear just seems to be so limited. Recently, an Ukrainian colleague of mine from Kharkov sent me a very interesting uh, book describing um, face-to-face encounters with residents of the underworld. It seems there are uh, entrances to those realms in uh, UK, in Poland and various other locations. And uh, some people have met entities of advanced um, technology. Others met entities which were hostile, reptilian type. It is entirely possible that we have a fully populated world below us in the ground. 
For example, some friends from Tajikistan were telling me something very interesting. When um, there are very heavy rainfalls, after that, in really small brooks, in high mountains, large fish appears, a meter or even uh, much longer. So this is a pretty large fish. It, it doesn't thrive in such a small brooks. Where does it come from in the high mountains? It is not a low place that it could have reached there easily. It's entirely possible that it actually comes from the underworld. Yeah, that very well could be. Land and water passages to habitable places underground are just so interesting to me. And we have to talk about Antarctica a little bit, too. Here's what you wrote about it. One of the most mysterious and least explored areas of the Earth is Antarctica. In recent years, there have been found numerous subglacial lakes with warm water and interconnected systems of tunnels where, according to information from various sources, these tunnels are quite numerous, ongoing at a depth of 3 to 4 kilometers underground, and it's even possible to get to other parts of the globe. Now, that's what I'm talking about. What kind of sources do you find credible that tell us about these tunnels? Yes, the existence of uh, Lake Vostok is uh, fully confirmed. And yes, various sensors um, have determined that uh, there are warm temperatures there. It is supposed that um, there are some sort of primitive organisms as well. But uh, the rest of the interesting stuff that you are asking about, I really don't know. And it is not my speciality either. So I could have even missed out some information on this topic. That's fair, but I was glad to read that you find it a bit mysterious too. This is also a bit outside of your wheelhouse, but maybe we can tie it in. You wrote about this other place, Nevado de Carchi. I think it's in Brazil, if I got that right. But you mentioned it's one of the areas of, quote, maximum UFO activity that attracts researchers from all around the world. Can you tell us more about that area? Do we find vast underground systems there as well? Well, I was under the impression that uh, this is actually Argentina, but you are closer to those regions, Greg, so your information could be more correct than mine. But anyhow, this is um, a region with high concentration of uh, UFO sightings. And as we mentioned, uh, people hear some sort of machinery working below the Earth's surface. And the same thing we have in Eski Kermen. I don't know if they see uh, flying objects above Eski Kermen, but interestingly enough, uh, currently I'm uh, in correspondence with a lady from Spain. Uh, we are organizing an expedition in that region, and she has been telling me that uh, regularly in uh, certain regions of Malaga, Flying objects rise as if from the ground itself. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about sustained underground civilizations, people might be inclined to wonder about the viability of that. How could beans survive and thrive underground? How can they grow crops? How can they get around without sunlight? You know, these kind of things. Some stories do talk about a strange glow. And I know you wrote about that as well. What's that about? As far as the glow is concerned, most definitely yes. I have uh, heard about it from Professor Dr. Yuri Zubritsky, who is an um, honorable uh, member also of the Peru Peruvian Academy of Sciences. So he has uh, seen himself a number of entries to um, the underground uh, tunnels in uh, South America and in number of instances he most definitely uh, reported seeing the glow. Some local people say it is um, seen in the areas where treasure is buried. That uh, glow has got uh, somewhat of a bluish hue and it is reported also in the 
underground uh, tunnels below Tibet and other places. Apparently, there is some source of uh, light that we are unaware of. It could be also some sort of uh, technology functioning on a principle totally unknown to us. The Tibetan Lama, somewhat of a controversial uh, person, Lamson Krampa, uh, he claims to have been in uh, some of these underground uh, chambers and he described, he says that he descended there and he described the spherical ball that was the source of uh, this glow. But anyhow, it is absolutely possible to uh, grow plants under artificial light. At one point in the past, I myself had a lot of indoor plants and I was very curious if I can uh, grow them in such conditions. I made my own experiments. What kind of light do they like? I made my uh, own grow lights and, um, for example, for example, some citrus fruits, they were growing under my lamps much faster than they would uh, grow out there in the garden, actually. The plants were absorbing red, blue and purple light. They were not interested in the green or yellow one. <laughs> right on. I've got some indoor plant growing experience of my own, actually. And we started this by talking about these super ancient time periods, these blocks of millions of years. And that's because you talk about these man-made tunnel systems being products of that neogene period. How can we get reliable dates for things thought to be millions of years old? How can we make that calculation accurately? It is extremely hard to date buildings of extreme antiquity. In most uh, cases, the best we can do is uh, when we see that they are covered by uh, later layers, and then we can conclude that um, they have been there before these layers that are covering them. Other indicators that could uh, give a clue are the degree of erosion and also if uh, we have mineralization which also takes a very long time those could be indicators as well for example the underground cities of uh, Cappadocia can be dated to some extent they must be older than uh, 5 million years because uh, layers that are considered to be 5 million years old are covering them and when I say covering I really mean that in a few locations they are really wrapped around around the ruins. They follow their outer shape. So that's why Cappadocia is surely older than uh, those uh, layers on the top of it. Now how much older that is another story. While the majority of other historic sites look uh, rather newish compared to the Cappadocia ruins, just uh, the visual difference is uh, striking by itself. Those that were built um, during the Middle Ages or let's say one or two thousand years ago, they look visibly younger. They look as if recently built actually compared to Cappadocia. Yeah, Cappadocia is such an amazing site that I would love to see someday. Very impressive when you Google pictures of it. But to connect this back to some of the mythology, it seems like the oldest stories talk about the gods and the Nagas and other beings literally going underground. But then later in Irish and Celtic lore, beings like fairies and gnomes are thought to be from underground, but almost in more of a multidimensional sense, like more of a mystical realm. Do you think these stories just changed as they got further from the original source and lost contact with these things? Or is there more of a multidimensional element that we're not considering? I remember reading extremely interesting uh, field reports in relation to dwarves. When I started my uh, higher education in uh, geology, I read this um, research that um, actually when they started developing mining in the Ural region, it transpired that all the ore deposits are already opened. Somebody has been mining there already. 
The local people of the region knew about it uh, already because the Chut tribe, which happens to be a tribe of uh, dwarves, well, that's what they are by profession. They're all miners. They find copper, they dig it out, and they make various uh, copper items. I have also seen that there are very interesting artifacts in uh, Central Asia, uh, silver spears. And uh, there, they were found in uh, very small tunnels, uh, chambers underground. Of course, the official explanation is that some uh, children, maybe one or two years old, were actually making and uh, going into these uh, small tunnels. But when you see the actual situation, how small the tunnels are and everything else, it's uh, obvious that the explanations are absolutely ridiculous. Actually, very respectable scientists have um, conducted numerous expeditions and they made amazing discoveries connected with this uh, race of uh, dwarves. Their settlements um, were found all over the Nordic um, regions of Russia and that continues up to, continued up to the 30s of the last century more or less, or less that was the time period until they uh, mixed more or less with us lived in our areas and after that suddenly all all of a sudden they left actually this uh, tribe this race of uh, dwarves uh, locally called chut is very well known amongst the native uh, residents of these uh, regions in siberia in uh, 17 up to the 17th and 18th century they maintained uh, regular connections with us there were messengers sometimes uh, going uh, backward and forward exchanging um, all kinds of information with uh, humans also there were some um, some sort of uh, trade exchange people would buy copper items from them and give them things that they would be interested in and all this was interestingly enough fully confirmed and very well documented by a number of uh, absolutely respectable scientific expeditions. The reports are still there, but they are not uh, included in the official curriculum of uh, the modern education on geology simply because it doesn't fit with the official paradigm. It's a very curious thing when things like that happen, and deception and cover-ups are always angles I like to point out in these kind of things. And a quote that's kind of relevant that I got off your site is, you say that it is necessary for one to find courage in him or herself to acknowledge that a lot of textbooks for schoolboys and students and lectures in colleges and universities are inaccurate. I definitely agree with you there, man. Do you think some of this happens out of ignorance and just not being able to keep up with recent discoveries, or are we purposely misled about our past? Yes, most definitely this is done on purpose. Just a recent example, now here in Russia, they're introducing a foreign type of education. Well, what does it mean exactly foreign? They're... Um, teaching much less um, stuff to people, actually, much, much less. They make them specialists only in a particular area, particular field. For example, we have physicists. Some of them specialize uh, even more only in atomic energy. Uh, the geologists, they also don't know full geology. They know only a very small and narrow branch of it. This is done with the purpose to make the people even more narrow-minded and to prevent them from e inquiring more into the nature of the world and the reality. Because the less people People know the less they can learn and the less informed they will be about everything. 
So this is being pushed by purpose now also in our country, uh, ruining the education even further. And another uh, face of it is um, sponsoring only research that agrees with the official paradigm, so to say. For example, my latest uh, scientific publication is on the topic of the so-called Ice Age that uh, officially, supposedly ended some 12,000 years ago. So when I was opening uh, the maps that were the product of research of very respectable scientific institutions, some over 100 uh, respected scientists have signed below each of these maps, it turns out that they're all useless because uh, the results, the published results, follow dogmas instead of uh, summarizing the data obtained by the actual tests and expeditions and um, the result of digging. If you read the actual field reports of these uh, very same scientists, you will find out that the mammoths lived in a warm climate. Uh, there were deciduous trees now growing, growing in what is now very cold parts of Siberia. Also, in the official conclusion of their work, we see that the climate zones were uh, like now, more or less, just uh, colder, supposedly, uh, in that period. But in reality, their field results uh, show that they were somewhat tilted, because at that time, the North Pole was somewhere in Greenland, Probably so. The climate zones were uh, also sideways, not uh, what we would call nowadays straight. So all these things you find in their actual field reports. But as far as uh, the conclusions of uh, the excellent work they have done, actually, they had to publish something completely different, something that uh, does not correspond to their actual research. And the only reason for this is um, that otherwise they would uh, lose their job, they would not get paid, their institution would get closed down. This is the reality. In this way, people um, are being tricked into believing in uh, all kinds of uh, dogmas, like, uh, for example, that we came from the monkeys and other stuff like this, they believe it because of the authority of the scientists that have uh, signed below that and are still signing. But what people are not aware of is that um, these scientists are not signing because of their actual research, but because of these financial considerations that I mentioned earlier. Hmm. Well, guys, that just about does it for us. I could not be more grateful to both of you. It really is fascinating stuff, and I'm so happy we were able to actually make it happen. Thank you very much again to all of you, and we wish you a nice day. All right, you too. Thanks again, guys. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. There we have it, guys. Whew, that took a lot of work. It was really worth it, though. Alexander knows so much about the underground structures. I was really happy to hear what he had to say. Sylvier was quite a champ because I had some odd questions in there and she went for it. She had to go through this whole two hours at least three times to do it live, translate it, and then read it through. So please thank her if you can. As I mentioned in the beginning, she's running the site megaliths.org. If you go there and you click on join in the field research, she has sites all over the world listed that they could still use some more pictures or footage of. You might be surprised to find out you live near one of these sites, and maybe you could contribute to this project and see a badass place at the same time. Also, New Earth is her YouTube channel with tons of interesting related info as well. 
Alexander Colty has been super awesome to hear his perspective, how he interprets mythology, but the bread and butter here is his knowledge and research into these underground structures and tunnel systems. And his website, once again, is earthbeforeflood.com. And you can get by with Google Translator and read a lot of fascinating stuff. He has huge portions of books that he's written up there and available for free. Lots of great pictures on both of their sites. And there were just a few parts of my lengthy, wordy questions that didn't get translated to him since they were just referencing things I found on his site. But I did want to point them out here. He mentions this guy Hans Ulrich von Kranz, who published a book in 2006 called The Swastika in the Ice, which I can't find reprinted in English because I've looked. But going back to Nazi explorations of the inner earth, he wrote, To continue the research in Antarctica on October 11th, 1938, Hitler ordered to allocate five submarines with special onboard accommodations to investigate. In early November... They located an underwater tunnel in the vicinity with the output of warm water. They entered the thick of it and floated into a lake with warm fresh water in a giant cave. Obelisks with inscriptions were found. In the same year, on December 20th, they found an artificial mine with even and smooth walls steeply sloping down, and next to them a stone statue of a four-legged winged animal with fangs bared. Between 1939 and 1941, they also found two abandoned cities within the entrance to the cave. I mean, that's pretty amazing stuff, you know? I would love to read that book. Alexander also went on to mention, it comes up again later here, saying, At the end of December 1973, Jacques Cousteau discovered the entrance to the underwater tunnel. Immersed in it, divers went through into a huge cave. Inside, they also saw obelisks with strange inscriptions and the fanged sculpture. They went no further because the tunnel mysteriously killed five people. Interesting stuff. And I was trying to find that swastika in the ice book. Like I said, I couldn't find an English translation, but I did find this article archived on the site whatdoesitmean.com, and it's obviously related. It's kind of long, but it's probably worth the read. So it says... A shocking Ministry of Defense report on the Russian scientific team that has successfully drilled 3,768 meters into the world's largest submerged lake on the continent of Antarctica. Believed to be untouched for over 20 million years, states that the underwater video camera discovered the striking image of a golden-like swastika estimated to be no less than 100 meters in height and width. According to this report, the discovery of this underwater swastika was made on January 30th, after which the ministry ordered into silence the scientists who have been working on this project for the past 20 years until highly specialized encrypted communication devices could be delivered to them. Upon their receiving their new communication devices, the scientists released their first report through Russian state media's RIA Novosti, which added into their announcement of the historic mission the following. It is thought that towards the end of the Second World War, the Nazis moved to the South Pole and started constructing a base at Lake Vostok. In 1943, Grand Admiral Karl Dantas was quoted saying, Germany's submarine fleet is proud that it created an impenetrable fortress for the Fuhrer on the other end of the world, in Antarctica. According to German naval archives, months after Germany surrendered to the Allies in April of 1945, the German submarine U-530 arrived at the South Pole from the port of Kiel. Crew members constructed an ice cave and supposedly stored several boxes of relics from the Third Reich, including Hitler's secret files. It is also rumored that later the submarine U-977 delivered the remains of Adolf Hitler and Eva Braun to the Antarctic base for the purpose of DNA cloning. The subs then entered the Argentinian port of Mar de Plata and surrendered to authorities. Lake Vostok is the largest of more than 140 subglacial lakes found under the surface of Antarctica. The overlying ice provides a continuous paleoclimatic record of 400,000 years, although the lake water itself may have been isolated for 15 to 25 million years. The surface of this freshwater lake is approximately 13,000 feet under the surface of the ice, which places it at approximately 1,600 feet below sea level. Measuring 160 miles long and 30 miles wide at its widest point and covering an area of 6,000 square miles, it is similar in area to Lake Ontario but with over three times the volume. 
This part's kind of review, but I'll continue. Russian interests in Antarctica, particularly Lake Vostok, were heightened after World War II when in 1947, American Admiral Richard Byrd led 4,000 military troops from the U.S., Britain, and Australia in an invasion of Antarctica called Operation High Jump, but who were reported to have encountered heavy resistance from Nazi flying saucers and had to call off the invasion. Most interesting to note about Admiral Byrd's Operation High Jump mission was his solo flights toward the South Pole on February 19, 1947, wherein he recorded in his diary the following. 1,000 hours. We are crossing over the small mountain range and still proceeding northward as best can be ascertained. Beyond the mountain range is what appears to be a valley with a small river or stream running through the central portion. There should be no green valleys below. Something is definitely wrong and abnormal here. We should be over ice and snow. To the port side are great forests growing on the mountain slopes. Our navigation instruments are still spinning. The gyroscope is oscillating back and forth. 1,005 hours. I alter altitude to 1,400 feet and execute a sharp left turn to better examine the valley below. It is green with either moss or a type of tight-knit grass. The light here seems different. I cannot see the sun anymore. We make another left turn, and we spot what seems to be a large animal of some kind below us. It appears to be an elephant. No, it looks more like a mammoth. This is incredible. Yes, there it is. Decrease altitude to 1,000 feet and take binoculars to better examine the animal. It is confirmed. It is definitely a mammoth-like animal. Report this to base camp. 1,030 hours. Encountering more rolling green hills now. The external temperature indicator reads 74 degrees Fahrenheit. Continuing on our heading now, navigation instruments seem normal now. I am puzzled over their actions. Attempt to contact base camp. Radio is not functioning. Gotta love reports like that. But okay, this is where it gets really interesting. Though deliberately obscured by the West today, Nazi German leader Adolf Hitler was obsessed with New Schwabenland, which was the name given to the area of Antarctica located between 20 degrees east and 10 degrees west, which he believed would one day be the world capital of his master race. Soviet archives have extensive files detailing that Nazi Germany and the United States forged an alliance prior to the end of World War II, allowing Hitler and cohorts to escape to their Antarctica base in exchange for German technology that included the atomic bomb and advanced fighter jets, rockets, and flying saucer technology. Let's get weirder. Not known to all but few about Nazi German flying saucer technology were that German brothers Walter Horton and Ramir Horton, were not only devout followers of Hitler, but were also the most advanced flying craft engineers in the world who not only invented the flying saucer, but also deliberately fabricated the American UFO incident known as Roswell in conjunction with the Soviets to destabilize the United States. Interesting to note in this report is it's only mentioning the golden swastika without any Nazi affiliation, which is important when this most ancient of symbols is taken into correct and complete context. Far from its being the symbol of the Nazi empire, the swastika is our world's oldest known symbol that dates back to the Indus Valley civilization of ancient India, as well as classical antiquity, and due to the extreme amounts of time estimated in the millions of years since man last looked into the depths of Lake Vostok, it is entirely possible that what has now been discovered in Antarctica may very well be another clue to who we are and where we really came from. <laughs> that's a lot, but that's pretty awesome, right? I would not be surprised if that summary was accurate. May 7th, 1945, the Nazis officially surrender. A couple months later, August 6th, 1945, we dropped the bombs on Japan. And then two years later, in 1947... The Nazis staged Roswell just to fuck with us. The CIA and British intelligence have done similar things, according to guys like Nick Redfern. I wouldn't be surprised, that's all I'm saying. But I do hope you liked this episode. We went from last week's show on the dangers of sugar to this week's the inner earth civilizations of extreme antiquity. <laughs> all over the goddamn map, right? Good luck determining a target demographic with that, huh? Yeah, but uh, in the Plus Show, more awesome stuff from Alexander. The way mythology explains the races of the world where we came from, tussles with reptilians. We talked about ancient anomalous maps, and we recorded this before the last show I did with Gordon White, where I started to think about these maps as precognition or remote viewing rather than relics passed down, but they're fascinating however they got here. We also spent some time on what's really Alexander's main focus right now, the archaeoacoustics of these places, and the idea of healing effects from acoustic or wave-based technology 
getting into that secret physics again. We also talked about how space travel might have worked, secrets of museums and the destruction of artifacts and giant bones, how the education system is structured to dumb us down, and how Russia is having the same issues that we're having on that front. All interesting stuff. And if you appreciate the work that went into this show and go in places that other people just aren't going instead of doing the same rounds with the same people and the same stuff, sign up for Plus. And also dig into the websites of both Sylvie and Alexander. And that pretty much does it for me. Your move, New Schwabenland Nazis of the Underground. Your fucking move. Take us home, Cornmo. Lucid dreams are so vivid Cause you go to bed at seven And your brain comes alive Cause you hate your nine to five You wake up with a dread And make sure your cats are fed Did your brain talk to a ghost Who moved your coffee and your toast As you listen to the higher side chats You get to your desk And your boss says it's a mess And your soul slowly grows To a place where nothing grows When you think he's not around You insert a SETI sound The OM says turn it down And you say it's just the higher side chats Oh, do you think you'll be invited To Bohemia Grove To a Bilderberg Club Oh, do you think you'll be invited by a Rothschild to a party on a submarine Diving down to the center of the earth To the Marianas Trench Your teeth begin to clench from the sulfurous stench The mask you're given doesn't fit Cause you're not one of them Starting today, you'll make plans to get away There's no one to hold you down And the what-ifs start to drown Then you wake to the glare of a cold fluorescent stare And the light winks at you Cause its life is almost through But it's holding on to quit time just like you It's time for the high side chats (laughs) 